If you love them, say hallelujah. Metropolitan. Welcome to Sunday morning worship. Let us pray. On this day of rejoicing, O God, of our ancestors, as we gather to break the bread, we remember that through the blood of the Lamb you redeemed us and made us pass over from death to new life. Grant that as we celebrate your mighty deeds, we may be one with Jesus in offering you this sacrifice of praise. In the name of Christ, amen. Wherever you are, let's lift up holy hands to them. Let's put those hands together. Come on, clap along. Come on and clap your hands with me. Come on and clap your hands with me. Come on, quiet, help me. Clap your hands. Come on, put those hands together. Clap your hands with me. Whoa, clap your hands with me. Clap your hands with me. If you love to say hallelujah. It's the highest praise, yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Listen. Come on and dance before the Lord. Come on and dance. Before the Lord, come on, do your dance. Dance before, dance before the Lord. Come on and dance before the Lord. Let me hear you. Dance before. Dance before the Lord. Come on, dance before the Lord. Let's sing that again, and I want you to dance in your house. Come on. Dance before the Lord. Come on. Dance before the Lord. Whoa. Dance before the Lord. Dance before the Lord. If you love us, say hallelujah. He's worthy of all the praise. Love to say hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, say hallelujah. If you love to say hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. heads in prayer our father Lord almighty God I acknowledge that you are the Lord of all the beginning and the end the first and the last of our author and finisher of our faith apart from you there is none other God 
powerful than you. We are here today standing in need of prayer on your promises. And Father God, we know your promises cannot come back void. The earth is yours and everything is designed by you. Oh Lord, we are grateful for everything you have provided for your people. Thank you for our church and its long history. So many people have grown up and worship here and return to this historical site and we have to give glory. We thank you, Lord God, to bring us thus far by your faith, never leaving or forsaking us. For you, Lord, are a great God, mighty in all your creations, and in your hands are the depth of the earth. We bring our sorrows and our pains and our concerns of this world situation to you today. Father God, you have promised that if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves, pray, seek your face, and turn from their wicked ways, then and only Father God, you said you will hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. So we are calling on you this day for a healing right now. Thank you, Father, for all your many blessings. I pray a special prayer for our pastor, his family, Lord God, and the work of the ministry you have called him to do. And may we receive from heaven your many blessings, and may we bless others, Lord God. Prayers go up for our members, both working and the ones that are sick and shut in. Bless them in body, mind, and spirit, Lord God. I call on a blessing for our leaders who are making decisions for our city, our state, our country. Open their hearts and their mind to move themselves out the way and be led and guided and directed by you to do what is right for your people. Bless our children, Lord God, for they are the future. Give them courage and strength to continue this race of life and to be a beacon of hope in the future to generations to come after them. Great are you, Lord God, and most worthy of all our praises. Your greatness is everlasting and we forever will praise your holy name. This is your servant who pray it all on the blood of the Lord of Jesus, who died and rose for us, Lord God. Amen. To all your people, may they say amen by the sound of my voice. Amen.
Anybody glad that they're covered by the blood? I don't know where you are right now, but I'm grateful that I'm covered by the blood of Christ Jesus. Truly, it is an honor and a privilege to worship once more and again on this first Sunday in the month of September. And while we've been through so much, many of us can testify to the fact that the Lord has brought us a mighty long way. And the fact that God has sustained us for nine months throughout this year is a testimony of what God can do. And I don't know about you, but we've been through enough, but we've lived to tell the story. And that's somebody's shout right there. Don't you miss your shout. Because while I've seen a lot, while I've encountered a lot, while I've experienced a lot, and now while I've witnessed a whole bunch of trouble and tragedy, I'm still living to tell the story. And that tells us that we serve a good God. Because no matter what we've been through, whether danger is both seen and unseen, we still serve a God who can keep us and preserve us and, 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 and bring us along the way. So we're grateful on today. We're grateful on today to still witness the goodness of our God. So with that being said, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, verses one through three, the book of Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, verses one through three, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Now, I'm going to be starting a new sermon series this month entitled Lessons from the Valley. But the word of the Lord reads and says these words. The text says, the hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Verse 3 says, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. For a few moments as we enter into this Lessons from the Valley sermon series, I want to talk to you all from the subject, the Lord knows best. The Lord knows best. As a matter of fact, while you are, wherever you may be right now, go on and turn to your virtual neighbor and say, neighbor, the Lord knows best. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and all wise God, we come before you on this first Sunday in September saying thank you. Thank you, oh God for the opportunity yet again to worship you. So now, oh God, as we enter into this time of hearing a word, God, we pray that the word go forth with both power and clarity. God, help us to be challenged, to learn, and also, God, to become better. And so, Lord, now we pray for not only the word that's being preached, but, God, that you make us good ground, so that the seeds that are being planted, God, can grow and sprout fruit in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for even this time. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. The Lord knows best. My brothers and sisters, this year has been nothing short of a valley experience. 
we face continuous challenges, disappointments, and moments that have made us feel like we have hit rock bottom. As time wanes on, it seems as if our challenges complexify and our problems continue to produce pain. However, if we were to be honest, on the flip side of our hurt, pain, and disappointment, we can all admit that there are some lessons that we have gleaned from our time in the valley. And my brothers and sisters, while many of us tend to only talk about the bad, the horrid, and the traumatic, we can all admit that we are learning some lessons and experiencing some things in the valley that we never thought that we would encounter. God is growing us in the valley. We are blossoming in the valley. We are getting rid of some unhealthy people and some unhealthy habits in the valley. We're divorcing toxic traits in the valley. And this sermon series is designed to help us be reminded of the lessons that can come from being in the valley. Yeah, I know it's hard to be in the valley, and I know that it is challenging, but thanks be unto God that our times in the valley can also work for our good, that it's not all in vain, it's not all tragedy and, 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 and pain, but there are some uh, moments uh, where even of us, some of us right now can talk about the fact that God is still working in the valley. There are some of us right now who can look back on our lives and testify and say that there are some lessons that we learned in the valley that have changed our lives. We found God for ourselves in the valley, not just that religion that Big Mom and them were talking about. We've had our faith grow in the valley. We've been stretched in the valley. We found true joy and not that superficial kind of stuff in the valley. And we have evolved into better persons along the way. Oftentimes, our valley moments create the perfect conditions for us to grow because we find out that we do not know everything. Sometimes, our own pride and ego can prevent us from becoming who God is calling us to be. And in the valley, we will find out that the Lord knows best. See, there are often times where we will think that we know best. Maybe it's due to the fact that we live in a data-driven society where we're dependent on upon our devices for every single answer and thing. Maybe it's because we as a people have gotten away from living a life of faith and trusting in the Lord and leaning not to our own understanding. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because we worship our materials more than we worship the master. But I've come to know that in life, especially in valley moments, that we should all come to know that the Lord knows best. And here in our text today, Found in the 37th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, the first lesson that we learn in the valley is that the Lord knows best. You see, Ezekiel is a priest who becomes a street preacher during Israel's exile to Babylon. Ezekiel was called to not only warn God's people of the dangers of disobeying the Lord, but also Ezekiel was called to prophesy in such a way that the people of God could be led to redemption. The Israelites caused their own ruin from thinking that they knew best. They conducted themselves in ways that violated their covenant with the Lord. And eventually they ended up being conquered by the Babylonians. Oh, isn't that something? A country that didn't believe that it needed God and held a disposition that it knew better than God and now came to a point in time where it didn't have God's protection and power against its enemies. And we see God's hand removed from this nation because they thought that they knew best. 
You see, Ezekiel's prophecy is directed to people who have been conquered in every way. The Israelite militia has been vanquished. The Israelite way of life has been disrupted. The holy city has been destroyed and the people were struggling in the valley. And at the point of our text, the hand of the Lord is placed upon Ezekiel and it takes him into a valley that was full of dry bones. This valley was the setting at one point for a battle and this valley represents the great defeat of the Israelites. All throughout the valley, there were bones and each of the bones were dry. This valley was as lifeless as it could be all throughout the valley. There were signs and visions of destruction, devastation, and countless lives lost in a massacre. And I just want to pause right there for just a moment because the text says that the God's hand was on Ezekiel and yet the hand of God escorted him to a place that was dismal and decaying. Don't you miss that thing? Because that's a word to some of us that we know that the Lord has led us to some places in our lives, but the current condition of where God has led us is less than optimal. That things are dead and things are decaying, but somehow we know that God has led us there. And there are some of us who are asking God, God, why did you place me in the middle of this valley? Why did you put me in the middle of all these dry bones? God, what are you up to or what were you thinking? God, I trusted you and I followed your will and I followed your guidance, but somehow all around me is mess and dead places. But don't you give up hope just yet because you might be the very agent for transformation that God might be trying to use to bring those dead bones back to life. Don't you worry about what's happening all around you. Just worry about the fact that God has brought you there. And whenever God brings us somewhere, whenever God places us somewhere, that means that God has a plan to use us right where we are. And so don't get discouraged about what you may see in the present moment, but get prepared for what what God has coming uh, in the future. Uh, don't you get caught up and uh, what you see right now, uh, but you got to trust and understand uh, that God knows best. See, and after Ezekiel is able to properly examine the situation, the Lord asks Ezekiel if, it, if these same bones uh, could live again. You see, these were the bones that had suffered at the hands of the Babylonians. These were the bones who laid in defeat. These were the bones that rotted and became brittle and dry. And the spirit of the Lord asked the prophet if these same bones uh, could live again. You see, this question does not deny the past uh, or the current condition uh, of these bones, but rather it begs and invites Ezekiel to not think about the past uh, or the present, uh, but rather rather about the future of these bones. Uh, you see, the Lord gives Ezekiel a chance uh, to weigh in on what he believes uh, is possible for the future of these bones. Uh, and in the midst of this, when posed uh, with the question, if these bones uh, could live again, uh, instead of relying upon what he had seen uh, or what he thought, uh, he chose uh, to show us uh, that the Lord knows best. And my brothers and sisters, we live in an age where we too have seen destruction and devastation. And we're not in denial of what has happened in our communities. We're not in denial of what's happened in the White House. We're not in denial about what has happened in our churches. We're not in denial about what has taken place in our homes and even in our lives. But the question posed is not regarding the past or the present. But the question posed is regarding the future. And see, uh, we all need to do like Ezekiel and trust that the Lord knows best. Too often we'll pronounce death over situations when God has constructed and orchestrated life to come forth. Uh, too often we give up before we allow God's opinion to come and be known. And so we need to be like Ezekiel and trust uh, that the Lord knows best. Uh, I know that what we've seen so far this year might suggest that nothing good can come into, uh, out of 2020. But we have to depend and know that God knows best. 
And so that brings me to a question. And that is, how does Ezekiel show us that he believed that the Lord knew best? Well, I'm so glad that you asked because I have one very short point to share. And that is, Ezekiel showed that he believed that the Lord knew best by allowing God to have the final say about the matter. He allowed God to have the final say regarding the matter. See here in the text, if we look at verse 1 through 3, it says these words, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live again? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. See, after the hand of the Lord took Ezekiel and placed him in this valley, we see that when Ezekiel was asked if these bones could live again, he allowed the Lord to have the final say. He responds after being given the question by saying, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. In other words, Ezekiel chooses not to share his opinion regarding the future of these bones, but rather he defers to the Lord for the final say. It is not that Ezekiel couldn't have given an opinion or a response. It is not that Ezekiel hasn't seen the ruin and the devastation. It is not that Ezekiel isn't aware of the spiritual and social conditions of the Israelites that these bones represent. It is not that Ezekiel is ignorant of how bad things are, but rather Ezekiel shows that the Lord knows best by trusting God's opinion over his own. He says, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. In other words, he allows God to have the final say. You see, he first of all addresses the Lord as sovereign, which shows that he understands that the Lord has supreme power and authority. Oh, sovereign Lord, that means Lord who has all power and authority. There's nobody that can touch you. There's nobody who has anything on you. Then he goes on to say that you you alone know. And so I'm not looking to anybody else or valuing anybody else's opinion, including my own, but rather, God, I know that you are the only one who is qualified to speak to this situation. I know what I've seen. I've seen all the bones. I've seen that they're dry. I've gone all around as the Spirit has taken me through, but I know that at the end of the day, I'm not the one who is qualified to speak for the future of these bones but rather God I'm going to let you have the final say Ezekiel understands that he doesn't need to have a, an opinion on the future of these bones you see because he understands that God's power is unmatched and God's power is not rivaled and God's power and authority is greater than anything that we've ever come to know and oftentimes, it's not a question of if God can do it. But rather, it becomes a question of if God wills for it to happen. And I need somebody to understand that today. It's not. See, sometimes we have found that there are times in our lives that certain things that don't take place or certain things don't come to be not because God doesn't have the power, but it may not align with God's will. And there are some things we want in our lives. There are some things we've desperately strived for. There are some things that we have uh, sought for or prayed for, and we haven't realized that maybe that thing might not be in God's will. Ezekiel knows that just by who God is, just by knowing who God is, he himself is unqualified to answer the question posed to him. He allows the Lord to have the final say regarding the matter. See, I like that, my brothers and sisters, because oftentimes we can find ourselves and dark and dismal situations. And we'll pass judgment on the potential of what things can be without giving God 
the opportunity to have the final say. Some of us have already given up on virtual learning, thinking that our children don't have a final chance instead of letting the Lord have a final say. Some of us have already written off our church believing that we are too steeped in tradition or our old ways to ever evolve into a place of worship for all generations. Can I just go there and talk about it? Some of us have written off this year not believing anything good can come out of our hardships and experiences instead of trusting God to have the final say. And all that I'm saying is that while this year we have lost our Black Panther, we still have not lost our king. And we need to let God had the final say as it relates to our lives. <clears throat> and if we don't learn anything else from our valley experiences, we need to learn to let God have the final say. I know what the media said. I know what the corporations have said. I know what the social media timeline has said. But we all need to be paying attention to what God is saying. Because I'm a living witness, my brothers and my sisters, that when God decides to do something, nothing can stop God's plan. Well, I wish I had somebody who could testify that when God decides to do something, nobody can get in God's way. When God decides to resurrect something, nothing can stop what God has willed to happen. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about a valley full of dry bones uh, or if we're talking about the issues of life. uh, I want you to know uh, that when God decides to do something, uh, nothing can get in the way uh, of what God plans to do. Uh, Not 45, uh, not those haters, uh, not those folk who are out there uh, trying to take black lives. uh, But when God decides to do something, uh, when God wills for something to happen, uh, there is nothing uh, or no one uh, that can get in God's way. Uh, And so I need you to know that God knows best. And so even as we face the challenges of life, we need to let the Lord have the final say with that cancer or even that coronavirus. Let God have the final say with that relationship. Let the Lord have the final say before we give up on the church or walk out of the doors of life. We've got to let God have the final say before we give up on that situation and we stop striving for our dreams. We've got to let God have the final say with this election. What we're going to do is vote first and then let God have the final say because the same God who created the heavens and the earth, the same God who put the birds in the air and the fish of the sea. The same God who formed us from the dust of the earth is the same God who still has all power in his hands. And is there anybody out here today that can testify to the fact that the Lord knows best even in 2020 with everything going on. God still knows best and it's not my job to try to figure out the future but it's my job to hold on to the one who holds my future and I believe that when it's all said and done that everything will be alright and so don't be discouraged don't be dismayed but rather have faith that the Lord knows best have faith no matter what the situation that the Lord knows best so that means that we need to let the God have the final say stop inserting your opinion into places where it doesn't matter or doesn't need to be but let God have the final say I know what those folk around you are saying. I know what those negative Nancys are saying. But we've got to look toward the hills from whence cometh our help. And we've got to let God have the final, have the final say. 
So this is our first lesson from the valley. Our first lesson from the valley is that the Lord knows best. So even as we face valley moments in our lives, even as we find ourselves in the midst of dried up bones and dried up situations, we have to be reminded that the Lord knows best. The doors of the church are now open today. There may be somebody out there who finds himself in a position where you are tired or trying to figure out your life on your own. You're tired trying to do this thing by yourself. That's you. I invite you to join this family to take part in the gift that was given to us by our God in heaven through his son, Christ Jesus. There may be somebody out there today who needs to be baptized. There may be somebody out there today who needs a church home. Somebody out there today that needs to rededicate themselves to the Lord. And I say to you, today is your day. After all you've seen this year, today is your day. After all you've been through in your life, today is your day. After all that you've gone through, the hell, the tragedy, the trials, today is your day. So we want to invite you to pray with us. Then we want to create an opportunity for you to express yourself and to reach out to us so that we can wrap our arms around you. Now we recognize that we're living in some challenging times. We're unable to gather together physically, but you can still reach out to us. If you're watching this message from our Facebook page, all you have to do is just send us a message and say, look, I want to be baptized. Look, I want to join this church. I need you to pray for me. Uh, whatever it may be, we're here for you. But if that's not your preferred method, you can just reach out to us by looking at the contact information that will be shown to you at the end of this broadcast. Because no matter where you are, no matter where you may be, we don't want to create any obstacles that will keep you from a healthy relationship with God. So we invite you to not only reach out to us so that we can wrap our arms around you, but we want you to know that during this time we want to pray with you so that God can begin to do a great work in your life. So with that being said, let us pray. Oh God, we come before you even right now. Praying for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. Who's come making a decision. Saying, Lord, I want a closer relationship with you. They may want to be baptized. They may want to become a member of this church or even rededicate themselves. God, no matter what the need, God, we know that heaven will supply. So for God, for those who are seeking salvation, God, we say at this time that, Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. God, we believe in the life, death, and resurrection. And God, even during this time right now, we accept the gift of salvation. We ask that God, that we might be rooted. No matter where we are in this world, in a church like Metropolitan, that believes that extra effort wins. God, even right now, we ask that you might put people around us 
who can help us to grow and flourish. God, take toxic folk out of our lives, but help us to grow. Because, Lord, we're tired of living on our own. So now, Lord, we turn our lives over to you. Saying, Lord, have your way. God, help us to have the courage that our faith journey, our walk, grows beyond just a virtual worship experience. But rather that it leads God to us being able to have our lives transformed. So Lord, we thank you for what you're doing even right now. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. It's also now offering time. There may be somebody out there who finds himself in a position where you're saying, God, I'm, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling with this. Let me tell you why we give or the ways that we give. That even during this time, we give in a way that is that is prayerful. Well, we ask the Lord to guide us in our giving. Because the Lord not only knows what we have, but the Lord also knows what is on the way. So there may be somebody out there struggling. What do I give? Pray about it. Ask God to guide you in your giving. But not only that, we give in ways that are, that are generous. Because we model God-like behavior. Every time God blesses us, God is generous in God's giving. With every breath that we take, God is generous. With the blood running warm through our veins, God is generous. And so we don't give in a way that is guilty or shameful. But rather, we give in a way that's generous because we want to be just like God when we share our gifts. But we also give in a way that is joyful. When we get excited, we get excited not only about what God is going to do with our gifts as they bless this ministry, but also how God is going to bless us for being faithful. And I know that there are some saints out there who can say, you know what, even through this pandemic, God's been good to me. God has kept me. God has preserved me. God has provided for me. And I've been able to keep on pressing and being faithful because God has been faithful unto me. And I believe that there's some folk who are in this season who are going to see God open up some major doors for you. You're going to see God work out some things on your behalf simply because you've chosen to remain faithful. I didn't say it was going to be easy. I didn't say it wasn't going to come without a challenge. But I believe that God blesses our faithfulness. And so with that being said, let us get ready to pray and bless our offering and bless our giving at this time. God, we pray now that you might bless every gift, that you might bless every giver. God, even bless those of us who desire to give but aren't in a position to do so. God, we pray now, not only for the Metropolitan Baptist Church, that you see to it that your church has everything that you desire for it to have. But God, I pray that you bless every member, every virtual visitor, every person that invested to this ministry from both near and far. God, enlarge their territory and even open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we don't have room enough to contain. 
And God, that's a good thing. Because if we can't contain our blessings, that just leads us to a life of continued giving so that we can bless someone else along the way. So God, thank you for what you're doing, even right now. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. And so, we thank you for your gifts. We want to let you know the, the methods and how you can give. You can give by dropping off your gifts each and every Friday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at our church located at 767 Walker Avenue. You can also give your gifts by mailing them to our secure P.O. Box. P.O. Box 262 Memphis, Tennessee 38101. You can give online through our online giving app, GiveLify. Locating our church within the app and then just in the press of a few buttons you can invest into our church but not only that you can give via paypal that's located on our website whatever ways that you contribute to our work we are grateful we are grateful for your love we're grateful for your kindness and we're grateful for your consideration now at this time i want for all of you no matter where you are to prepare yourselves to remember the greatest gift of all and that was salvation through the life, death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. We now prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. Let us hear the words of a 
Apostle Paul found in 1 Corinthians. The text says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to remember. Allow for us to not forget the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. As we reflect upon this moment, God, allow us to examine ourselves, search our hearts, and draw nearer to you. God, we ask that you bless the elements that lie upon this table. Soften our hearts and transform this church to be useful for thy cause and kingdom. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. right now. This is a time for us to remember. No, no, not the tragedies of 2020, but the triumph of over 2,000 years ago where a man from Galilee gave his life on an old rugged cross. He was executed by the Roman government. But yet God raised him from the dead. And I believe that even in these moments where people have tried to bury us, people have counted us out, God will still raise us once more. So with that being said, no matter where we are, no matter where we may be, let us all eat together. Recognizing that that blood was shed for us, let us all drink together.
Amen. It is said that on that night they sang a hymn and went out into the Mount of Olives. So what I want you to do is to remain worshipful even beyond this virtual worship experience. Take time to sing the songs of Zion. Reflect on the goodness of God and keep on believing that the Lord knows best. Let us look to the Lord now. Oh God, how we thank you for what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard. God, we want you to have the final say. And so God, keep on working in our lives. Keep on working in this church. Keep on working in our communities. Keep on working with our children. And God, we want to let you have the final say. So now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit continue to rest, rule, and abide with you all now henceforth and forevermore. May all of the children of God say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.